It comes in chapter 8 of Acts, starting at verse 26. As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, Go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under the Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was now returning. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go over and walk along beside the carriage. Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, Do you understand what you are reading? The man replied, How can I, unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up to the carriage and sit with him. The passage of the scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, was this prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with this same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop, and they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Meanwhile, Philip found himself further north in the town of Azotus. He was preaching the good news there and in every town along the way until he came to Syria. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus uses a number of references to himself beginning, I am. I am the light of the world. Uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this reading, Jesus says, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't bear fruit, and he prunes the branches that they do bear fruit as they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce <clears throat> fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. Anyone who dies does not remain in me, is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and in my words, my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. And this brings great glory to the Father. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. I really wanted to preach on the eunuch today. I'm sure you wanted to hear more about the eunuch. Eight times, I think, they mentioned the Ethiopian eunuch. And I thought, well, there's 
Jesus talks about pruning and we have the eunuch, but no, we're not going to go there today. We're not going to talk about eunuchs. We're going to talk about that image that Heidi um, elaborated on about the vine and the branches. Well, uh, I went to seminary in Berkeley, California. Some of you know that. If you've ever been there, you know it's a, it's a great place. And, and in the center of the university area, there's a street called Euclid Street. South is Telegraph Avenue. That's a famous kind of hippie area. And Euclid Avenue has all these great shops and um, restaurants and things like that. And there was a place on Euclid where everybody gathered. By everybody, I mean professors from UC uh, Berkeley. Uh, there are eight seminaries there, Franciscans, Jesuits, Lutherans, um, Baptists, uh, Methodists, Presbyterians. So you had seminary students, you had visiting scholars from all over the world gathered in one particular coffee shop, and it was my favorite, called Coffee Connections. And I don't know, that's, that's like my happy spot. And for years after seminary, I would go, go to Berkeley, go visit friends at the seminary community, and always go down to Coffee Connections. A Turkish couple owned it for 50 years or something. It's just one of those places, kind of magic, really, wonderful places. And one year, uh, several years after I got out of seminary, I went down there and everything looked the same and the Turkish owners still had it and there were still people from all over the world there, except something had changed. And what had changed seems kind of minor, but it really struck me. What changed was it was no longer called Coffee Connections, it was called Coffee Grounds. And I asked the owners, gosh, I'm just so disappointed. It was just such a you know, descriptive phrase of what happened there. And he said, well, we had a lawsuit and we had to change the name and we're not very happy about it either. And business has fallen off a little. I know, I don't know if he said that, but I thought something was missing. I know it's just a name. Everything else stayed the same, but it stuck with me. Just coffee connections. People came to be connected and find community. So uh, after my first call, we in Bremerton, Washington, we, had, um, we started a weekly lunch meal. Um, you have the community meal here at dinner. We had a lunch meal served by different groups, and we called it the lunch box. We thought that was kind of fun. But then we said, you know, this is going so well. Why don't we coordinate efforts on housing and on other health care and things like that? And so we formed a, a nonprofit organization, and I got to pick the name. And I didn't call it Coffee Connections. I said, oh, we're going to call it Community Connections. I love that name, Community Connections. That's what we're about, connecting together. We went to register the name, and I couldn't believe how many community connections there were. We couldn't use that name, and it's just really caught on fire, the word community connections. And so we ended up being community connections of the greater Rice Lake Barron County area, incorporated, something like that. Community connections, people need to be connected. And that's what we did. We had the meal, and we sit down with folks very different from ourselves, and try to find our commonality. Well, I think um, the problem no longer is the idea of connection. I think maybe one problem that we have now is we're too connected. We're too connected to the wrong things. Too many things, maybe that's a better way, maybe not the wrong things. We're so many connections. Yesterday afternoon at the youth gathering, we had 300 kids, and it was great. They did some incredible kinds of things I'll get to, little uh, exercises, little skits and things, and it was very powerful, a very powerful experience. We went to lunch and we had to wait our turn for our table to be called, and every single person at the table pulled out their phone, and usually it's me, so I'm not picking on the kids, this is all of us. Every single one, we had a little quiet time, and I'm thinking, gee, I wanna get to know these kids better, here's our quiet time. Because we, we're all connected, and again, it's not them. We all do that. You look at a group of adults. You got a little bit of quiet time, and everybody who's so connected to things has, has to use their devices. You go camping, and everybody's got all their connectivity and so on. Do you have Wi-Fi? I'm just as guilty. We're just so connected. We're over-connected. And one of the things at this stage of my life as I look to the finish line of my ministry is to be less connected. 
I think there's a balance there that we need. We're so connected. And then you come to church and people want to connect you even more. And if you say, well, if I don't say yes to that, then I will be a bad sport. If I don't join this committee uh, and somebody asks me, it's hard to say no. There's where the pruning comes in. We talked about in the lesson today. We need to prune those saplings in our life that suck away energy and aren't life-giving. And sometimes they may, be, may even be connected with the church. Um, sometimes we take on, we say yes to too many things. This is a time of the year when we ought to be pruning a little bit of the things that suck our energy. They're not bad things, but we can't do everything or we're exhausted and we're resentful. At least I think that's our tendency. I do a pre-marriage inventory test and I meant to bring a copy of one of them out um, because you could see that they're this thick, the report that comes out. And there's about two million couples that have taken this premarital um, inventory and it produces really great um, picture of this two couple, of this couple coming together. And um, if I do any weddings here, I'm gonna spoil the ending here. So I can't do any of your weddings because I've already told you what the ending is. But the, my favorite part of this big thick report is at the end, there are two shingle sheets, and they show, uh, and I wish I had put it up there, they show a grid of 25 squares with a matrix, and one side is flexibility, and the other side, at the, at the bottom uh, axis is um, uh, closeness. Flexibility and closeness, how flexible, how close. And a lot of times you get couples that are really close at this point, you know, they're getting married, and they're so close, they're overly connected. They're overly connected and they end up maybe on the fringe there and then the flexibility uh, axis. So where you want to be is flexible and close, not too flexible, not too close. Find that balance. And I think it's really helpful for couples to see you don't have to spend all your time together. And eventually you might be on the other end spending no time together. Find a balance. Be flexible and connected. Have a life outside and uh, yet be connected. And notice what Jesus says. He doesn't say be connected to every single person in this giant web of connection. He says be rooted and connected to me, the vine. You're the branches. I'm the vine. Be connected to me and all the other relationships um, will flourish. And maybe flourish so much that you need to prune a little bit. So I'm here to tell you do less, but do the right things. Do less, do the right things. So this idea of connectivity to me, I'm beginning to say, I'm going to change the word. It's not a bad word to be connected, but I, everybody, I get a newsletter from my health provider, and it's called Healthy Connections. And, and they're helpful, you know, stress reduction, weight reduction, get more exercise, do smart things, eat better, and so on. And of course, I know that the one thing they don't talk about is be connected to the vine. They're not a Christian organization. Uh, so they're not going to tell you, you know what, the most important one is to be connected to the vine. The others are important, but be connected to the vine. And the vine is Jesus and God's word. And a lot of times churches get so busy, we forget why we do the things we do. We have all kinds of committees. We're do, rushing around doing good things, and we forget, no, wait a minute, how does this introduce people to Jesus? How does this connect people to God's word? Are we just piling on more connections that sap energy? Or are we really helping to be a part of giving life in Christ? Compassionate, um, not compassionate, but the health cabinet yesterday had a seminar. I couldn't be here. I hope it was about care in the name of Jesus. That's a good thing. We met with the youth at the youth event. And uh, I thought, well, there's something. There's, these are two keeper things. But you start multiplying those, and every, every one of us says, well, the things we do are important, and they are important. But you can't do everything. So instead of the word connection, I'm going to try another word that I think is particularly helpful um, and gets away from connectivity. And I thought of this because there was a church in my hometown of Tacoma that, um, uh, that formed in the 70s, and it's like 10, 12 15,000 members called Life Center, Assembly of God, filled with a lot of former Lutherans and Methodists and Presbyterians. Um, 
for lots of reasons, not necessarily all good in my view, but lots of reasons. People find life at Life Center. But when Life Center was starting, they had bumper stickers, and I thought, this is really clever. And the bumper stickers were very simple. They said, the joy of belonging. I said, that's what it's about. It's not about connectivity. It's about feeling that you belong somewhere meaningful, that we're getting life and it's meaningful and we have an identity and it's a place where we can be accepted among people without regard to race and wealth and status and education and so on. And yesterday I thought about that joy of belonging when I saw the kids called forward by the they had two hip-hop leaders, uh, musicians, one I know pretty well, Dave Shearer, and another one I hadn't met before named Joe Davis. He was black and David uh, is, is white and they do this hip-hop and it's just powerful. I know my hip-hop, you know that. Uh, but I'll tell you, Christian hip-hop is just powerful with these kids. They call the kids up and they had them do these skits where they said, I want you to reenact something like um, a bad scene, like a kid being bullied or um, somebody that's um, hurting and others pass by on the other side of the road. So they, they're up there on the stage enacting it like clay. Yeah, they're moving them like clay models. And then they say, freeze. And then they send, they, they invite the audience to come up and some of the audience of kids to come up and change the scene, kind of move their arms. And so whether they're doing this, they move it to you know, maybe this, hands on their shoulders and so on. They transform the scene. They ask the kids, what was the first scene like? And I couldn't believe how many times the, the kids would say, it's talking about bullying. And, and, and how did it change? Well, people cared about me. They you know, came and instead of having a fist, they had um, laid hands on or they had signs of love and so on. And they got the kids talking about this. 300 people out there, kind of like today, 300 people in the same congregation. And the kids would talk about being at school and being excluded and being bullied and being um, you know, harassed. And they talked about how the, the other scene was about being accepted and belonging and, and, and not judged for what they look like and, and whether they were you know, popular or whatever. They just want to belong. That's what they want. They want to belong someplace where people love them. They don't want a whole bunch of more activities. They don't need that. We don't need it either. We just need to know we belong. In God's house, we all belong. When we're... Te- when we're um, When we belong to this vine, when we're connected to the vine, that that really is the most healthy connection. And out of that, hopefully, we become a community where people feel they belong. And as you prepare to call another pastor, you know, don't spend all the time talking about all the activities that you do. Talk about the, the kind of people you are and who you're welcoming and how you welcome. We could all do better about that, couldn't we? People outside are looking for a place that they can belong to and feel that they're accepted for who they are. But today's a good reminder maybe to do a little pruning. My wife's home with the literal pruners up there. But we can prune some of the stuff that just keeps us busy and doesn't give us life. May the peace of God in Christ, which passes human understanding, keep our hearts and minds focused and connected to the true vine, Jesus. Amen.